the No Optimized Management of Asparaginase Therapy in Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia. This program is supported by an independent medical education grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Before we start, please take a moment to let us know who you are and answer the polling questions in the tweets below. Tweets also include details regarding how to obtain your free CME credit. Be sure to watch our handles for additional ALL CME programming as this webinar is the first event in a series of six activities and follow at Bonham CE for more CME certified programs on Twitter. I'm Dr. Lori Muffley from Stanford University and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Brian Cassidy and Dr. Luke Mace. Hello, I'm Ryan Cassidy. I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and attending physician at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance in Seattle, Washington. Hello, I'm Dr. Luke Mays. I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Utah Huntsman Cancer Institute and Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. Our disclosures are shown on your screen. Our program today is the first of six events about ALL. We will be streaming five additional newsroom broadcasts on at Bonham CE's Twitter page with further discussion. Stay tuned. Upon completion of this educational activity, participants should be able to articulate the significance of non-adherence to the dosing of asparaginase in the management of acute lymphoblastic leukemia based on patient-specific factors and clinical guidelines discern when a patient should permanently discontinue, temporarily hold, or continue with peg aspergase, or change to an Erwinia asparaginase product, distinguish between allergic and non-allergic infusion reactions, and determine if there is a need to switch to an Erwinia asparaginase product, and compare asparaginase Erwinia chrysanthemide, Erwin, or recombinant Erwinia, with asparaginase Erwinia chrysanthemide based on efficacy, toxicity, manufacturing, dosing, and administration. So today we're going to be talking about acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a malignant proliferation of lymphoid cells arrested at an early stage of differentiation that can invade the bone marrow, blood, and extramedullary sites. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia is overall a very rare cancer, representing approximately 0.3% of all cancer diagnoses in the United States. However, just about half of newly diagnosed ALL occurs in children, with a secondary bump in incidence in young adults and then again in the elderly. As we can see in the figures, the incidence of ALL in the United States has been increasing over time. Fortunately, the mortality associated with acute lymphoblastic leukemia has been decreasing. Finally, ALL is the second leading cause of cancer-related mortality in children in the United States behind only central nervous system tumors. Again, looking at the incidence of ALL across the age span, we can see in the slide on the left, take from US SEER data, that approximately half of all newly diagnosed cases are in children. When we look at mortality due to ALL, we see that there's an equal distribution across the age spectrum, meaning that although ALL is more frequently diagnosed in children, the overall mortality rates are lower, whereas ALL represents a very rare disease in adults, but the mortality rates are higher. The treatment of frontline therapy of ALL typically occurs in several blocks, beginning with induction therapy followed by consolidation then followed by a delayed intensification phase, and then of course a prolonged maintenance phase, approximately one and a half to two years and up to three years for boys. The use of asparaginase is an important component of induction consolidation and intensification therapy for ALL. Select patients may be appropriate for allogeneic stem cell transplant and first complete remission. Asparaginase is a non-essential amino acid that can be synthesized from aspartic acid by most cells using asparaginase synthetase. However, ALL cells lack asparagine synthetase and import asparagine from the plasma, making them uniquely sensitive to depletion of plasma asparaginase. Asparaginase catalyzes the conversion of asparagine to aspartic acid and ammonia and deaminates glutamine to glutamic acid. In the absence of asparagine and glutamine, leukemic cells undergo cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. Pharmacologic administration of asparaginase 
depletes plasma asparagine, thereby killing ALL cells, but not normal cells that can make their own asparagine. Several asparaginase products have been on the market. The currently available asparaginase products are either derived from E. coli or from Erwinia. As you can see in this slide, depicting all of the products that have been available over time, there's been quite an array. However, currently in the United States, what is commercially available is PEG aspergase, which is a pegylated form of asparaginase that's E. coli derived, Erwinia asparaginase, which is derived from Erwinia, and now we have recombinant Erwinia or Rylase. So how has the outcomes of particularly young adults with ALL changed over time. A very big breakthrough occurred in the management of young adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which was the recognition that when adults of younger age are treated with regimens similar to those that have been used for decades in children with ALL, outcomes appear superior relative to the conventionally administered adult ALL regimens. And what makes pediatric regimens different from adult ALL regimens is namely the intensive use of asparaginase-related products associated with pediatric regimens. Here you can see from two different studies, both conducted in Europe, the outcomes of prospective trials using pediatric ALL regimens with heavy incorporation of asparaginase when administered to young adults. And in the GRAIL trial on the right, even in older adults, up to and beyond 55 years of age. Now you can see the outstanding outcomes of the NOFO trial on the left, which showed that even among adults between the ages of 18 and 45, the outcomes with the use of this pediatric regimen were excellent. In the GRAL study, one of the main take homes from this trial was that once you get to approximately the age of 55, toxicities start to accumulate with the use of the pediatric regimen. And so generally in the United States, the pediatric regimen approach has been limited to adults up to the age of 40 or 50 years old. Now, the largest study in the United States to prospectively evaluate the use of a pediatric regimen administered to young adults was conducted by the US Intergroup. The name of the study was CALGB10403. This was a prospective phase two clinical trial that accrued patients between 2008 and 2012. The regimen used was very similar to a COG protocol, AALL0232, a typical pediatric regimen with the incorporation of asparaginase throughout induction consolidation and delayed intensification. The median age of AYAs on this trial was 24 years of age and the treatment-related mortality was exceedingly low with this approach at 3%. This was published by Wendy Stock and colleagues in Blood a couple of years ago, showing a three-year overall survival with this approach of using the pediatric regimen in young adults of 73%. And this compared very favorably to historical controls, which demonstrated overall survival rates using um, adult regimens in comparable age groups of only approximately 40 to 50%. There are accumulating data that not only is the incorporation of asparaginase very important in terms of outcomes of the pediatric regimen, but also that missing doses or early discontinuation of asparaginase can be linked to inferior disease-free survival, particularly in patients with high-risk ALL. These data come from two COG protocols where these analyses were performed evaluating the role of early discontinuation of asparaginase. And in multivariable analysis, there did appear to be an association with inferior disease-free survival in patients with higher risk disease, underscoring the importance of asparaginase to the regimen and in ideally completing all doses of prescribed asparaginase. I would now like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Luke Mace, who will be talking about asparaginase management pearls, hypersensitivity reactions, and therapeutic drug monitoring. Thanks, Dr. Muffley. Here's a table of three E. coli-derived asparaginase products. The first one, E. coli-derived asparaginase, is no longer available in the United States, and so we won't spend much time discussing this. In the table, you can see it's divided up into source, what the indication for each medication is, the dosing schedule, and the route of administration. The two products we'll spend the most time discussing are PEG aspergase, uh, which is approved in pediatric and adult patients to be given on an every two-week schedule, either intravenously or intramuscularly. Cal aspergase pegol is approved only in patients age 21 and under at the moment to be given on an every three-week schedule. 
So there are two major studies that looked at Cal aspergase and PEG aspergase efficacy and toxicity. We'll review the Dana-Farber Consortium study comparing Cal aspergase and PEG aspergase. In the slide, you'll see on the very left the dosing comparison between PEG aspergase and Cal aspergase in induction. On the x-axis, you'll see time in days, and on the y-axis is the serum asparaginase activity level. And you can see in the dark blue Cal aspergase does seem to last a little bit longer in terms of serum asparaginase activity compared to the light blue PEG asparagase in induction. In the middle, you will see the comparison in the consolidation phase of treatment. Here you have a very equal amount of serum asparaginase activity level throughout consolidation therapy. And on the very right, they reported a equal overall survival in both the patients who received PEG aspergase versus the patients who received Cal aspergase. So really what this trial told us is that um, you could give less Cal aspergase, which was a total of 10 doses uh, in, a con in the consolidation phase versus 15 doses of PEG aspergase in the consolidation phase due to the longer acting um, nature of the medication. Now transitioning to non-E. coli derived products or Erwinia chrysanthemum derived asparaginase products. There are really two forms of this product that are available in the United States. In the first uh, white, uh, white background, you'll see that there is chrysanthospace or asparaginase Erwinia chrysanthemum. Now there is difference in these products really comes down to where the product was made available and approved for actual use. So chrysanthospace is approved in Europe Asparaginase Erwinia chrysanthemum is approved in the U.S. Due to historical shortages of Erwinase, there was some special approvals given to use chrysanthospace in the United States. However, this was very limited, and now, again, it is no longer available unless you work directly with the company, Horton Biopharma Limited, and the distributor clinician to get this product. So these Erwinia, Erwinia chrysanthemum products are short-acting products, and as you'll see there in the dosing schedule column, that this drug is given on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, six doses to replace a long-acting product, either intravenously or intramuscularly. The other product available is asparaginase Erwinia chrysanthemum, Arwin, also known as recombinant Erwinia. This product is different than Erwinase in the way it's produced. So it's a recombinantly produced medication that uses a novel expression platform using Pseudomonas fluorescence. The dosing is listed there and the schedule though is every 48 hours. It is currently being investigated for other dosing schedules. And again, this is only approved currently for intramuscular use. Now here's a case presentation that, that we can go through together. This is a 22-year-old female who was diagnosed with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia with the cytogenetics listed there and was treated by using the CalGB10403 regimen and achieved a CR with persistent minimal residual disease, though, after induction. And because of this, a donor search for an allogenic stem cell transplant was initiated. However, during consolidation, she developed symptoms displayed on the right including flushing, tachycardia, hypotension, and nausea after her second dose of PEG aspergase. And switching this case up, if the patient had a similar presentation at day 43, after the third dose of intravenous PEG aspergase, instead of the symptoms previously mentioned, she instead developed hypotension, swollen eyelids, chest pain, and an urticarial rash. How would this change our management? Hypersensitivity to E. coli-derived asparaginase is a well-known side effect of the medication. It has been reported to occur in up to 20 to 30 percent of people receiving this medication. There are two types of hypersensitivity reactions, which we'll talk about. Risk factors are listed there on the slide. We know that treatment schedule matters. The highest chance for a reaction occurs with the second or third dose. There are some genetic variants as listed there that are also associated with a higher risk of hypersensitivity although these things have not moved into the front line in terms of testing patients. And then if we talk about prevention, there are several ways to do this, and this includes how we're infusing the medication, whether or not we're using pre-medications, and then what effect these prevention techniques will have on how we manage giving asparaginase, and this includes therapeutic drug monitoring, which is a nice segue into the therapeutic drug monitoring itself, or TDM. 
on this slide, we have outlined what constitutes a proper asparaginase activity level. So because asparagine itself is difficult to measure uh, under uh, clinical conditions, and there are really no commercial labs available uh, to do this, serum asparaginase activity or SAA is really how um, you measure whether or not you're getting uh, therapeutic efficacy out of this medication. And so in each of these boxes, we discuss different aspects of therapeutic drug monitoring. And so for PEG aspergase, certain levels at certain time points are important, highlighting really here the greater than or equal to 0.1 international units per milliliter at day 14 is really the internationally agreed upon standard. Looking at Arrhenia asparaginase, because again, this is a shorter acting medication, you have to consider whether or not the patient is getting it at an every 48 hour or every 72 hour interval. But again, the greater than or equal to 0.1 international units per milliliter still applies here. Patients can have a silent inactivation and you will not know that unless you're checking these levels themselves. And there are certain thresholds to define silent activation. We talk about any level below 0.1 at seven days or a level that's less than quantifiable at 14 days. Comparing that to our winning asparaginase, again, you know, this is a short acting medicine. So the same thresholds may apply in terms of 0.1, but this is more that different trough level. So a 48 hour or a 72 hour post-dose check, depending on how the patient is getting the medication. Common symptoms of allergic and infusion reactions is displayed on this slide. I think one of the, the most difficult things about trying to delineate these things is there's much overlap. Infusion reactions can happen with any medication. Asparaginase is not unique in that sense, but trying to differentiate these two things is very important. And there's a great review um, written by Mike Burke and Sue Reingold uh, that was published in 2017, which talked about different symptoms and, and how to differentiate these things. But really it, it comes down to clinical judgment a lot of the time and uh, in experience. And so if you'll see in the left, there are certain things that you'll more think of an allergic reaction. And then in the very right circle, it's things that are more of an infusion reaction. But again, you, again, you have this overlap. So it is difficult, but it's something that's important to do and, and something that is important to be comfortable with when you're evaluating a patient. In terms of the management of these clinical allergic reactions and how to grade them, this graphic has been adapted from the CTCAE, which, you know, if I'm being honest, it can be a, a little bit confusing. Uh, because they have different categories for uh, infusion reactions versus allergic reactions. But here we're talking about allergic reactions, and we, of course, grade our adverse reactions, and this is no difference. You have grade one, two, three, and four. How I think of it is, you know, you grade an allergic reaction based on what intervention you're using. So if someone has a reaction and you give them something orally, you know, Benadryl or another antihistamine or even a steroid, if you're giving it orally, you could consider this a grade two reaction. However, if that patient had a reaction and you're giving something IV, really the CTA-CAE then calls this a grade three reaction. The symptoms themselves can overlap and certainly grade three symptoms should be more serious as it indicates here, bronchospasm being one of them. But again, it's your indication in what you're doing to treat that reaction that changes some of this grading. And then of course, grade four, these are life-threatening things and this can occur with asparaginase, and that is exactly why, you know, these patients need to be closely monitored, and this needs to be given in the center where nurses and providers are comfortable administering this medication. And then in the bottom part of each of these grades, we talk about what are the recommendations to do if a patient was going to have one of these reactions. And, and there is some, some controversy here, but with a grade three or grade four reaction, switching asparaginase preparations is going to be the gold standard of care. In the grade two reactions, I think, you know, there, there is some debate on what you should do. And we'll talk about a study uh, in a little bit of that looked at rechallenging of patients who had grade two reactions. Uh, but, you know, it, it, for the most part, people do recommend switching um, asparaginase preparations uh, if, if you're able to do that. So again, differentiating infusion versus allergic reactions can be a difficult thing. And, and this is an algorithm that Dr. Burke and Dr. Reingold put in their review First, you look at uh, the asparaginase reaction. What are the characteristics of that? What were the symptoms? You know, what was the timing? What was their previous exposure, right? And TDM, checking levels like we had talked about. And then you can see moving through the algorithm, you have an infusion reaction versus an allergic reaction, or maybe a scenario where you're not sure, like, like we talked about, you could have uh, overlapping symptoms. And then 
you know, what to do about that. It talks about what you should check. Obviously, you need to check a, a serum asparagus activity level. One of the things we haven't discussed is how asparaginase can lead to an elevation in your ammonia level. Hyperammonemia can give you symptoms like an allergic reaction. And so some centers will check ammonia levels and can have a high level of ammonia, but also have an allergic reaction. So it's, it's one of those things that takes some nuance. And then looking at the allergic reaction itself, you know, obviously this is a systemic thing. How are you going to grade this moving down the algorithm, checking those serum respiratory activity levels? Is this going to be a patient who needs to be switched to a non E. coli derived product? And then you have the unclear scenario where you're not really sure. And, and again, Really, it involves checking the levels, checking your SA levels, uh, looking at your ammonia, kind of you know, looking at patient situation, really thinking about the reaction, the symptoms they have, and you know how you move forward with that. It you know, really does take some thought. There was a study that was recently reported on rechallenging of patients who had grade two allergic reactions to asparaginase for the treatment of childhood ALL. One of the best figures from this report is displayed here. This included 81 patients of the 300 that were enrolled on their ALL trial, DFCI 16001, 68 of them had grade two reactions. So what they did is, is they allowed these patients to be re-challenged with PEG asparagase itself in the setting of pre-medication, of course, and very close monitoring. And what you'll see is a breakdown there between the induction patients who had reactions and patients who had reactions post-induction. And then who was successful with the re-challenge who had failed the rechallenge, what the SAA levels looked like as well. And so really what the, the take home point of their report is that 50% of patients uh, with a grade two allergic reaction to PEG aspirase were, were able to tolerate and achieve adequate SAA levels when rechallenged. So, so the Dana-Farber group does um, recommend rechallenging patients who have grade two reactions. I think, again, this is an important distinction you know, and why we spent a little bit of time on the, on the grading uh, of these reactions. And, you know, there, there isn't you know, a, a ton of difference between grade two and grade three and, and really knowing who is appropriate for this and, and who is not is very important. So in terms of switching, you know, we talked about uh, very briefly the shortage of Irwinase and Irwinase over the past decade that we've experienced. And this really led to a development of a new medication for common in Irwinia. This was a phase two, three study of this medication in patients who are allergic or hypersensitive to E. coli derived products. The dosing regimen included three different dosing levels. It was first started out only intramuscularly, and then there was an expansion of the trial to give it intravenously. But here is data just from the intramuscular cohort, and you'll see the treatment-related adverse events. And there were some patients who had some side effects, but I think what the take-home from the trial is that this asparaginase product has similar toxicity to all other asparaginase products. There are other side effects here listed that are well known, but the safety profile is consistent with other asparaginase products, and the majority of patients do tolerate it quite well. And then looking at the efficacy of this new medication, this displays the serum asparaginase activity levels at different time points. We know that at 48 hours, over 90% of patients will have SA levels greater than or equal to 0.1, which is the internationally agreed upon cutoff for efficacy. The left-hand table broke down the cohorts by different dosing as indicated there. And in the light blue is the SA levels at 48 hours. And in the dark blue, you have the SA level at 72 hours. You can see in cohort 1A, which is the 25 milligrams per meter squared dosing, at 48 hours, you're getting appropriate activity. But at 72 hours, that activity level tapers off a little bit. But at the other dosing levels, you're getting higher 72-hour SAA levels. And in cohort 1C, we're getting above the 90% threshold at both 40 and 72 hours. On the right, the graph talks about the greater than or equal to 0 0.4 SA levels. Now, this isn't as consequential, but again, still important information as some people have shown some decreased efficacy when you get below 0 0.4. So back to our patient case. So we want to think about the first scenario that we had and go over some of these questions, Dr. Muffley. Given what we know about this patient, how would you classify her reaction? Um, and what, what would you do about a reaction like this? Yeah, that's a great question, Lori. I think, um, you know, begin because you can have overlap of these symptoms, but, you know, this patient, you know, flushing isn't something uh, I consider, you know, a, a slam dunk for an allergic reaction. Tachycardia, certainly, um, 
is a general symptom and, and um, can happen for many different reasons, especially in a, in a sick cancer patient who's getting an infusion in the clinic. And then hypotension, I think it's a soft hypotension call. I mean, this patient's blood pressure isn't that low. And, and nausea, as we know, aspergines can cause nausea uh, regardless, uh, especially when given intravenously. So, so I, I would, you know, favor um, that this isn't, you know, a true allergic reaction. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's always hard to tell. Like Luke, I agree. This sounds more like an infusion reaction as opposed to a true allergic hypersensitivity type reaction. So in that case, the management, I think, uh, would largely be supportive um, and talk, and then, you know, talking to the uh, infusion staff regarding how fast the infusion was being given, uh, as I'm sure many of us can appreciate with busy infusion centers, you know, sometimes our staff may be uh, inclined to uh, give the drug maybe just a little bit faster or on the faster end of a range, depending on how it's ordered. Uh, so communicating with the staff to see, it, well, is it possible maybe it was running a little faster than desired and maybe that's what prompted it. Uh, if pre-medication was not being given, uh, then that might be an indication to pre-medicate in the future. Um, but I wouldn't typically... Uh, you know, uh, change formulations or anything like that, at least based on, on, on the data we have here. Okay. As we introduced this case, we gave two scenarios and now moving uh, to the second scenario where the patient had differing symptoms. So this patient developed swollen eyelids, chest pain, and articarial rash, a little bit lower blood pressure than our first scenario. And then we talk a little bit more about risk factors, timing and genetics as well. So Ryan, what do you think with this patient, you know, knowing now what we know with these different symptoms and some of these risk factors, you know, how would you, how would you consider, would you classify this as a true reaction? Um, and what would you do? This to me sounds more consistent with a true hypersensitivity allergic reaction. Again, the, the, while the blood pressure being a little bit lower, uh, is, is notable. I think the, the swollen eyelids, the urticaria, uh, certainly sounds more like uh, hypersensitivity uh, than than what we typically think of as a uh, infusion reaction. So this would certainly be a patient where I would be uh, more suspicious about uh, neutralizing antibodies, uh, and that's certainly backed up by the asparaginase level. So in that respect, essentially, it's like you never gave them asparaginase at all therapeutically. Uh, so this would be somebody I would be trying to promptly switch to an Irwinia product. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, with, with this constellation of symptoms, you can talk about the timing. You know, the risk factors are important, but um, you know, really what what says it right is the is the therapeutic and drug monitoring. So, you know, the the patient with a less than um, uh, zero point one level uh, really indicates this. And and when we talk about switching, you know, we talked about the medications you can switch to. Um, and so, uh, thinking about you know which medication to switch to, I think. You know, you have you have two options. What what what's available? I think it is important, right? And and if we think about recombinant Irwinia, um, you know, how should this medication be given? Uh, you know, the current approval, right, is for is for intramuscular dosing only, uh, given it at a forty eight hour uh, at at forty eight hour intervals. And, and so that's you know, if we're using that medication, that's that's how it should be dosed. So after switching medication, how do you then handle monitoring? And is that something that you do in your clinical practice? You know, I, I generally don't. Um, and it's, it's in part sort of a pragmatic issue, I guess, for me. It's because I'm not, I don't know what else you'd do with it, right? So, I mean, there may be some nuances regarding what dose uh, could, you know, is there a way to alter the dose of the specific product you're giving based on the uh, asparaginase activity level. Uh, that I'm not sure we know enough to be certain of. So then, and, and you know, if, you, if you're neutralizing the Irwinia product as well, you, I guess you could argue, well, now you're just not giving them any benefit at all and you're wasting money. Um, but, you know, there, there, it's not like there's a third line option to switch to in this situation. So you know, it's not something I'm doing routinely. Fortunately, this is a pretty rare scenario. Um, it, it's very challenging when it occurs, uh, but it's not something I'm doing routinely in my practice. Yeah, and I agree with that. There's not not a, not a ton of data, right? On, I don't think on inactivation of, of, of Irwinia-based products. I think 
because these things are commercially available, it's something to consider, but again, not something we typically do um, in our practice, in our pediatric practice, and, and not something that's typically done within pediatrics itself. You know, I do think, uh, you know, outside of the, the breadth of this discussion, the, the Dutch group has done some stuff with, with um, individualized uh, asparagine, uh, asparaginase dosing, and I think there is something to that, but again, that takes a ton of infrastructure. It's not something we do here in, in the States, and um, but something to, to maybe look to the future uh, for um, uh, when we talk about adjusting doses of, of both um, short-acting and long-acting products. Luke, with respect to intramuscular versus intravenous administration, what types of toxicities or, or different toxicities are you looking for? Great question. I, I mean, there was a hot um, debate about this, I think, more uh, more recently, but, but I think we've kind of moved past it in terms of hypersensitivity reactions. I think there was a thought, right, that that IV, um, you may have more uh, hypersensitivity reactions. You know, there was a great review, again, you mentioned Dr. Burke before, but he did a, a great review of, you know, I don't know, it was like almost uh, five to 10,000 pediatric patients and compared IM versus IV on the COG-based um, backbone and patients enrolled in these trials. And there was really no difference uh, statistically in terms of hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, when you give something IV versus IM, you know, and I don't think, uh, I don't think in my mind that there's a major difference between some of the, the major side effects either that we talk about, pancreatitis, thrombosis, hyperbilirubinemia, and pediatrics anyway. So, I mean, I know certainly IV medications, I think, are associated more with some GI side effects um, than versus IM. Uh, that's you know, my takeaway from it, especially in, in the, with the short-acting products. And Ryan, what's your experience with intravenous versus intramuscular? My my experience is primarily going to be with you know peg aspergase and 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 IV administration and then the Irwinia products given IM, um, you know so in some cases, while there has been this debate about what side effects are more likely with this route or the other, um, you know as there are you know relatively well established um, methods of administration now with these two different products, I sort of stick with with those and just kind of deal with whatever whatever I see, it, you know, the mode of administration doesn't necessarily impact, um, or the side effects don't necessarily impact the mode of administration I'm choosing in that respect, so. Luke, you presented data from a study in which patients were re-challenged after grade two hypersensitivities reactions. But what do you do if you see grade two reactions in patients who you've previously pre-medicated? I think, you know, for us, grade three, we would switch um, especially now with an available product, recombinant winnie is available and, and, and something we can get uh, within 24 hours, really. So, so uh, we would do that. I think the grade two becomes a question, right? And I, I think that's where the nuance nuances are. You look at the reaction. You really have to evaluate, you know, whether or not you really think is it a true thing. I think based on the Dana Farber data, uh, rechallenging is something that you can do. Uh, but again, this is a, a specialized thing, and where you should have you know, a lot of nursing support and, and institutional support and also be, you know, in my, in my arena, right, in the, the childhood uh, arena, you know, be upfront with these families and, and uh, tell them, you know, that this could happen and, and make sure they're, they're aware and on board with some of these things uh, if you're trying to do something a little bit differently. Uh, that's kind of how we view it. Ryan, what's your approach to this? Pretty similar for us, too, in the adult population. For us, it's a little different where it's more you know, particularly for young adults, uh, if they're, you know, a typical headstrong 20 something year old, they might, you know, they might put their foot down and refuse, <laughs> you know, if they get a, a pretty serious reaction, but you think you could rechallenge them, they may say, you're not giving me that drug ever again. So I've encountered that a time or two, in which case, uh, if you're going to give them something, you've got to switch. Okay, let's talk about therapeutic drug monitoring. Luke, is that routinely done at your institution? And Ryan, how do you approach this in your practice? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we, we've got a nice kind of system um, down for that, and we do that. And again, most most pediatric centers, you know that they're supposed to be doing it. I think it just depends on the logistics. Can you do it for every dose? Maybe not. Um, but you really want to try and be doing it more often than not if you're if you're pre-medicating patients. That's kind of, you know, the, the mantra in, in childhood. Yeah, you know, for us, we, you know, for a while when Erwinia products weren't really available at all, uh, a few years ago, we, there was really, in my view, there really wasn't a clear reason to uh, measure because you're looking for silent, if you're looking for silent inactivation that you can't do anything about, 
uh, it sort of begs the question, why are you even bothering to test? Uh, but now that, that there are other products available, uh, it, it certainly, I think, makes it a little bit more, for, from a practical perspective, makes it more appropriate. But it is logistically a little challenging because this is not a common assay that a lot of oncology labs are doing, making sure that, you, that your lab personnel know what sample to draw and where to send it and, and all that. Luke, when choosing an Irwinia product, are you routinely using the recombinant product or do you try to import Chrysanth Pace? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's it's more of a of a availability and a time issue, right? It, it, because recombinant Irwinia is just a, is available readily, we can just say we need it, our pharmacists get it, you know, within, within a day. It, it just makes it a lot easier. Now, um, you know, before this drug was FDA approved, it was approved, approved in June of, of 2021, we... Um, had explored, in, you know, getting uh, uh, to space imported, uh, but but right now we have moved, you know, really exclusively uh, to to recombinant because it's it's FDA approved, it's shown efficacy, and it's just, you know, there's only so much time in the day, right, for us. So. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, and I think you know one of the interesting things, and you touched on this during your your earlier didactic, is is the dosing and the frequency, um, you know, for us at my center we have very robust you know, weekend infusion services. So uh, this notion of giving the drug every 48 hours, if you start Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, then you're dosing on a Sunday. Um, that's, that's feasible for, for us in our, in our system. Uh, but, you know, many do not have that luxury, in which case you're faced with this issue of, do you give a higher dose on Friday to cover, to cover through the weekend and, and resume then on Monday. I'm not. I'm not sure how you guys handle that issue. If you have weekend availability like we do, we do have that here. We're lucky. This has been a hot, you know, topic again within the pediatric circles um, because of the 48-hour approval. And as you mentioned, not everyone has these um, these resources that we have. We're, we're incredibly fortunate and and lucky to to have the support that we do. I think you know the FDA is approved for 48 hours. Uh, you know, and, and that's you know that's where I would leave that issue. I would say. And again, I didn't mention this, but but you know, there, it's under investigation. Additional, you know, dosing regimens, including a, a, a different dose uh, given, you know, to cover for 72 hours, is under investigation. Uh, and it was reported, you know, at that in the ASH abstract, and and we'll have upcoming reports as well um, shortly. So so I think you know, it is what it is right now, and we recognize it. But but the the point of of seeking the approval early, I think it's important to make this point is because we didn't, as you said, Ryan, didn't have anything available before. And, and we wanted to get this product available to patients uh, as quickly uh, and as safely as possible. And that's why we, although we recognize the limitations of the, of the, of the approval, um, it's better to have that than to have nothing. So with that very robust, thorough discussion on a really challenging nuanced topic, uh, I'm going to transition to prevention and management of other asparaginase toxicities, of which there are, are many. This was a comparison analysis of the experience from the adult cooperative group CA10403 trial compared to a cohort of patients treated on the pediatric AALL0232 study for high-risk B-cell ALL. So this was not a head-to-head -head comparison, but two independent cohorts of patients this graph depicts the differences of some of the more common classes of toxicities. The median age in the C10403 cohort was 24 years versus 72 in the COG cohort. And you can see in terms of the frequency, this is grade three or four adverse events that were generally more seen in the CALGB10403 cohort, particularly the ones that are most notable. There's the hyperbilirubinemia, the elevated alanine aminotransferase, and then hyperglycemia hepatotoxicity, hyperglycemia, and then not as common, but notably increased would be thrombosis and pancreatitis. I'm going to touch on each of these in, in turn uh, throughout my portion here. So those data were looking specifically during the induction course. This slide here shows the essentially the same different toxicities, but now we're looking specifically during the so-called post-remission points. These are going to be doses given during consolidation and interim maintenance and so forth. Generally, again, the older cohort treated on the CLGB10403 study is going to have more toxicity than the younger patients. One important thing to point out, which again, I'll touch on a little bit more, the hyperbilirubinemia, not as common in this phase of treatment, but elevated transaminases are still a pretty large issue. It's notable that 
in the C10403 study, only 39% of patients completed all of their planned protocol treatment. And that compares to 74% of younger patients and 57% of the patients over 18 treated on the pediatric 0232 study. When you think about this, it suggests that uh, age and the treating physician may be a factor here. Again, these were virtually identical uh, uh, chemotherapy regimens. So it's not something that's regimen distinct. Uh, the most common reason for lack of treatment completion wasn't necessarily due to unresolved toxicity, uh, but one thought was that the physicians that were treating patients on the CELGB10403 study were switching patients to non-protocol treatment, sort of throwing in the towel, so to speak, after seeing some of these toxicities because you know, uh, unfamiliarity uh, with the regimen, un, you know, being unclear on how to manage it. So they took them off study and proceeded on to a different regimen that they were more comfortable with. To focus in on a few of these different individual toxicities, first I'll focus on hepatotoxicity. So this is the most frequently observed adverse event of PEG aspergase in adults. Both hyperbilirubinemia and elevated transaminases are observed. It's important to note that this is typically entirely reversible, and it rarely leads to clinical signs of liver disease or liver failure. Uh, it is, as I've said before, quite common um, with nearly half of patients experiencing hyperbilirubinemia and nearly all patients developing elevated transaminases, with the former being primarily seen during the induction course. The risk factors for this include older age, obesity, having a low baseline albumin, a low platelet count. There are some pharmacogenomic analyses, but these aren't necessarily routinely assessed. In terms of management, there's some data out there. It's largely limited to case reports and case series, but the use of L-carnitine as a way to potentially alter mitochondrial metabolism and thus impact some of the underlying pathophysiology of this liver injury. Beyond that though, it's mostly supportive and avoiding things that make the liver unhappy otherwise. So holding other hepatotoxic medications, whether that's azole antifungals, uh, occasionally the thought of dose adjusting, other uh, hepatically metabolized medications may come up or holding subsequent doses of asparaginase will sometimes occur. Um, however, one important thing in, uh, that I think is critical to understand is again, because hyperbilirubinemia is generally a, a phenomenon of induction, uh, you typically can re-challenge uh, patients with PEG aspergase um, if that develops. So unlike some of the other toxicities I'll mention, uh, even if patients develop severe hyperbilirubinemia, if you are able to keep them on the, the current, that treatment approach, it's usually safe to re-challenge them in subsequent uh, courses. Hypertriglyceridemia is another complication of asparaginase-based therapy. So over three quarters of adults will develop this at some point. About half of patients developing grade three or higher elevations, that's gonna be greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter. It's typically seen later in the course of treatment. So beyond the first cycle, it's more common as you might expect in patients with a high BMI. Often this will be something that the lab will notify you about that the sample is lipemic, unless you're routinely measuring this. So it might be that that's the only indication you have. In terms of management, often you can just observe if it's a particularly high level of triglycerides, We'll sometimes intervene with lipid-lowering medications like gemfibrozole, phenofibrate. There are some thoughts that this is actually the underlying trigger for some of the other toxicities that I described. So some people will think that it may be a way to uh, prophylax, so to speak, against those by intervening, though I, I think the, the data that support that are, are not entirely clear. But again, you can generally re-challenge patients, particularly if you've started them on a medication or if you've repeated the triglyceride level and it's come down. Hyperglycemia, another very common complication, particularly with concomitant steroids. Management, as you might expect, is primarily with insulin. I've gotten used to, in my practice, uh, having patients learn how to check their blood sugar and administer uh, sliding scale or supplemental scale insulin if they develop hyperglycemia, because this is so common uh, just to have that available to them if the issue arises. Uh, but again, not something that is necessarily prohibitive. You can typically re-challenge patients once you get their blood sugar under control. So here is a case that is going to highlight a different toxicity. So this is a 35-year-old man who was diagnosed with B-cell ALL with a normal karyotype and received the remission induction course of the CELGB10403 regimen and achieved a deep MRD-negative remission after the induction course. 
and then went on to receive remission consolidation. However, on day 43, he presented with nausea, vomiting, significant abdominal pain, and his labs were notable for a low platelet count, a normal creatinine, a slightly elevated bilirubin, but very elevated levels of pancreatic enzymes, amylase, and lipase. He then underwent a CT scan that showed interstitial edematous pancreatitis and a peripancreatic fluid collection with signs of necrosis and pseudocyst. So when this occurs, uh, this is a very challenging problem, uh, as we'll uh, discuss a little bit later. Pancreatitis really is a complication of this therapy that can be very devastating if it occurs, particularly if it's serious. So older age, high-risk ALL for some reason is associated with it. Management, generally speaking, it's fairly similar to other forms of pancreatitis, alcohol-induced pancreatitis or gallstone pancreatitis, where it's supportive care with pain medication, fluids, supplemental nutrition, and so forth. In severe cases, however, patients may require surgical intervention, but again, that's as controversial in this arena as it is in other forms of pancreatitis, perhaps made even more complicated by the fact that these are patients who have recently received chemotherapy. For a mild case of pancreatitis, whether it's very minimal symptoms or asymptomatic elevations of amylase or lipase, some would say you can re-challenge in that situation. However, unlike some of the other scenarios I described, in a severe case, grade three, grade four pancreatitis, uh, rechallenging is usually not uh, advised. Uh, this is also typically not a situation um, where switching formulations from E. coli to Erwinia is necessarily uh, thought to be uh, prudent. So when this is observed, it is a particularly challenging situation. So then returning back to this case, the decision here, because of the severity of the pancreatitis, the evidence of necrosis, the severity of the symptoms, this would be a considered grade four. So this would be a situation where rechallenge would not be advised and asparaginase of all sorts would be discontinued. As unfortunate as that may be from an oncologic perspective and what that might do to his outcome, uh, it's really uh, in the best interest of the patient to avoid uh, causing more serious or life-threatening complications. The last couple of toxicities I mentioned are the ones that I find the most interesting from a pathophysiologic perspective. As a hematologist, this is definitely uh, in our wheelhouse. So hypofibrinogenemia, it is not uncommon to see patients have significant reductions in their fibrinogen level below 100, below the range of detection, and then associated with that, abnormalities and some of their other clotting times. It's more common in the first cycle and in patients who are obese. As interesting and as sometimes scary as these numbers can be, uh, often the management uh, can be, uh, uh, frankly, benign neglect, as I sometimes like to say. Uh, often you can just avoid doing anything about it. Uh, somewhat, uh, perhaps ironically, if you're less familiar with this pathophysiology, the risk of bleeding in this situation is actually quite low. It's thrombosis that's the greater risk. Um, if a patient is bleeding or if uh, invasive procedures are needed uh, or serious procedures are indicated, there may be a role in that situation for supplementing with cryoprecipitate, but it's important to understand that that can actually increase the risk of thrombosis. If this is observed, again, generally, you're safe to re-challenge with asparaginase, again, in part because this is primarily a feature of the first cycle of treatment. On the other hand, um, but uh, related to this pathophysiologically is thrombosis. So this is a, a relatively common phenomenon, particularly in older patients it's more common during the induction cycle. Concomitant steroids may increase the risk, obesity, and then factors that are likely contributing to impaired venous blood flow, so a mediastinal mass or the presence of a central venous catheter. And then, as I mentioned before, if cryoprecipitate is administered to address a low fibrinogen level, that can increase the risk. There have been a number of studies looking at different methods to try to prevent thrombosis monitoring and repleting antithrombin levels when they are low, because it is thought that one of the things that is precipitating these thromboses is an acquired and temporary antithrombin deficiency. Other groups and other centers advocate for the use of uh, pharmacologic prophylaxis in the form of low molecular weight heparin, as long as the platelet count isn't low. This is also aligned with some professional society and expert guidelines that endorse this approach. In addition, the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis uh, are in favor of monitoring antithrombin and repleting if the level is below 50 to 60%. Uh, 
But uh, a recent study that was uh, published in Blood um, within the last couple of years from the uh, French cooperative group uh, provided their uh, sort of observational experience with, with some of these different strategies. Uh, and interestingly, antithrombin-3 supplementation did not appear to uh, have a significant impact on the incidence of VTE. Uh, as I said before, uh, giving cryoprecipitate did not uh, improve outcomes. If anything, it just increased the risk of venous thrombosis. Uh, unfractionated heparin uh, prophylaxis did not help. Uh, so ultimately, um, for, for this reason, uh, at least in my practice, uh, I am typically not doing anything active to try to prevent thrombosis, uh, instead uh, taking a more conservative approach in treating VTE if it occurs. If that happens, um, it's generally managed in a similar fashion as other forms of VTE. Um, low molecular weight heparin is thought to be uh, the preferred agent uh, recognizing in this circumstance, again, since heparinoids require the use of antithrombin for their activity, uh, you may want to monitor antithrombin levels in that situation. Um, while uh, the uh, hematology world has uh, largely embraced the use of uh, direct oral anti uh, direct oral anticoagulants uh, for the management of VTE, there are very uh, sparse data supporting their use. Uh, it's very interesting uh, from a pharmacologic perspective that they would be useful or effective, but unfortunately, relatively little in the way of data to support it. And there are certain drug interactions that have to be considered. The other factor to consider is whether or not to rechallenge asparaginase in the event of thrombosis. Generally, in my practice, as long as the patient is responding to anticoagulation and isn't experiencing too much in the way of serious symptoms, I will generally rechallenge with asparaginase when they're due for their next dose. The one exception would be in the relatively rare cavernous sinus thrombosis. That would be a situation where rechallenging may not be very wise because of the potential neurologic sequela of worsening thrombosis. Thank you, Ryan. Let's discuss some of the data that you just covered. Luke, I'll start with you. With respect to preventing hepatotoxicities, are you using carnitine in your practice? For us, if we have um, an obese, you know, um, adolescent um, or young adult, we will certainly consider using it uh, as prophylaxis. I, I would say we, we don't often do that, but as you went through the case, I mean, if there is a patient who has, you know, liver toxicity, it's like, what can you do about it? The damage is done. And it's one of these things, like we talked about this a little bit with pre-medication, it's, it's harmless in, 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 in almost every sense. So in my mind, there's no reason to not to not use it. And, and I'm excited about, um, there's a, there's going to be a randomized trial coming out. Um, that's going to be in CTNY that'll involve the COG. It'll be a young adult. It'll be kind of a joint trial and, um, they're going to see and, and, and hopefully put, uh, give, give some more data behind the, the use of this product. I've never used it to prevent it. I have used it maybe a handful of times in patients that developed, uh, severe hyperbilirubinemia during induction. Um, you know, I would say, I guess I would say my experience is somewhat mixed. Uh, and, you know, the challenge is this is, these are, you know, generally self-limited uh, toxicities. Uh, so as long as nothing else serious occurs, it, these almost always resolve with time. So really it's just a, it's more of a question of, does the carnitine perhaps help accelerate that? Uh, that's certainly, if that's the case, that's great. Uh, you know, as you said, um, the, the, the consequences of this can be significant if you're altering their treatment schedule or limiting doses and so forth. Uh, but to your point, uh, it might be that this agent is better used uh, before all that damage is done to prevent uh, this from happening. Luke, we touched on pharmacogenomics. Does that play a role in how you're treating ALL currently? Within the framework of asparaginase, there's nothing uh, pharmacogenomic wise that, that we use. And that's not really part of our protocols in, in the pediatric world um, within asparaginase. The one place we do use it, of course, you know, is, is with antimetabolite therapy, um, uh, which has been used now for, for decades. And, uh, but that's separate from this discussion. But otherwise, you know, we're not really using it as much. I think there's several reasons, right? It's, it's not, not feasible for many centers. You can't get this information in real time, cost issues, and, and you know, how is it going to affect what you're going to do, right? Say one of these patients has one of these variants, are you going to not give them asparaginase? I think, you know, we would all hesitate about that. We would just have more data, right, before we give it, know the risk. So. I agree. It's uh, also not something that 
that I'm not doing in my practice and I don't think has really uh, become uh, a part of the standard in adult ALL either, but certainly as we learn more, uh, I, I could imagine this becoming a more routine practice, whether that's particularly in adults where there are several non-asparaginase containing regimens out there that are often used, whether that might be useful as a way to decide between these different approaches. Lastly, I think we should talk about anticoagulants for thrombosis. Are you using anticoagulation either as prophylaxis or for treatment currently? Great question. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit behind, right? I think in the pH world compared to, to the adults because of, you know, how these drugs were investigated. Uh, in general, we're not using them so, so much, even in the hematology world, although we're trying to move move that more forward. Certainly there's there's plenty of advantages. I just think in, in talking with our, with my, you know, benign hematology colleagues, there, there's just not as great of data in peds as there is in adults in these, in the sense, and be outside of the, the ALL scenario, right? And so within ALL, there's really minimal data at all. But again, uh, more to come, right? There is an active clinical trial um, through the COG um, looking at a pixaban prophylaxis and induction uh, for patients. Uh, Sarah O'Brien, Dr. O'Brien led this trial in its completed enrollment. We haven't had any um, readouts from the trial, but that should be coming this year. And I think it's an exciting kind of area because if you can do something to prevent some of these things, I, I mean, this is, it would be a game changer, I, I think so. But no, we're not, to answer your question, we're not really using that um, them at all. While the data to support them in this specific scenario are lacking, uh, I have uh, myself used um, some of the uh, oral anticoagulants uh, for the treatment of VTE uh, in this context. Um, since it's still a venous thrombosis, uh, even though it didn't necessarily rise to the level of being included in some of the pivotal studies, I still think of it as a non-label indication. It's just one without as much evidence to support them. And considering all the studies that have been done showing how these agents are just as good and, and sometimes safer than low molecular weight heparin, uh, certainly uh, warfarin in this situation would be incredibly challenging considering the hepatotoxicity and the alterations in diet and everything. I could never imagine doing that. So, uh, I ha but, but prophylaxis, I think, if you're starting to talk about giving everybody a dose of this medicine uh, to prevent these events, I think that is definitely something that would warrant uh, having better evidence to support uh, before incorporating into broad use. So, I'd like to summarize um, our discussions for today. First, asparaginase or pegaspergase improves outcomes in first-line treatment of ALL in both children and adults. PEG aspergase is standard of care for ALL treatment in North America and Western Europe. There may be a role for cal aspergase, PEGOL, due to improved stability. Erwinia products are currently used second line following an allergic reaction to PEG aspergase or cal aspergase PEGOL. PEG asparaginase, Erwinia chrysanthemi, or recombinant Erwinia is FDA approved in the United States and differences in manufacturing process may alleviate drug shortages. Therapeutic drug monitoring can help to discern between allergic and non-allergic reactions and if patients should change to an Erwinia-based product. Most toxicities with asparaginase are manageable and patients can be re-challenged. Adherence to asparaginase therapy improves outcomes in ALL. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please make sure to claim your CME credits by completing the post-test and evaluation form at the link on screen. And make sure to follow Bonham CE on Twitter to stay tuned for more ALL content.